The San Diego City Council is tackling housing affordability today. Coming up, three changes the city hopes will do the trick. The streets and the sidewalks are for the people, not for any company or companies who think that they, they are the owners. The mayor of Tijuana is taking back the streets from yellow cab drivers. It's an effort, he says, to help ease the minds of American tourists. We need to monitor where we are in relationship to our goals. Are we achieving our goal? Do we need to do something different? And a faulty monitoring system is hampering efforts to gather key data. That's a cornerstone of San Diego's Climate Action Plan. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. The San Diego City Council is holding a special meeting today on housing affordability. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen says council members are expected to approve three changes to city code to address the housing crisis. Most everyone agrees housing in San Diego is too expensive. Councilman Chris Ward put it this way. As a, somebody who's a father of a three-year-old, I think ahead, you know, 25 years from now, and I hope that she'll be here in the San Diego community, able to actually live in her own home and not my home. Um, but, um, but that's something that uh, we, we chuckle, but that's something that everybody has certainly been faced with today. The council's actions include easing restrictions on building granny flats, streamlining approval for projects that meet sustainability and affordability standards, and making it tougher to block projects using California environmental law. Most experts attribute the affordability crisis to not enough housing being built. Some council members expressed concern that the items were too much of a giveaway to developers. They asked staff to return with more information when the items get a second reading at the city council. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. The driver of a tractor trailer found packed with immigrants outside a Walmart in San Antonio has been charged with the deaths of 10 passengers. He could face the death penalty. Over the weekend, police discovered eight bodies along with dozens of others inside the sweltering truck with no ventilation. About 20 people were taken to the hospital. Two more died there. The driver is charged with illegally transporting immigrants for financial gain, resulting in death. In Mexico, the rise of ride-hailing services like Uber have been a hard pill to swallow for cab drivers as it's cutting into their business. And in Tijuana, this competition has given rise to violence against tourists. But the city's mayor is taking action. KPBS Frontiers reporter Jean Guerrero has more. For decades, sidewalks near the San Ysidro border crossing like this one were crowded with yellow taxis, known as taxis amarillos. Now the yellow vehicles are gone, replaced by cabs of other colors and more modern modes of transportation like Uber. Tijuana police are stationed along the street to make sure the yellow taxis don't come back. The streets and the sidewalks are for the people, not for any company or companies who think that they, they are the owners. Tijuana's mayor, Juan Manuel Gastelum, has banned the yellow taxis from nine areas where they've long gathered. The decision came after a violent clash between yellow taxi drivers and Uber riders was caught on camera. One of the people injured was a Chula Vista resident. Gastelum says the yellow taxis have been bullying tourists into using their service for decades, with aggressive language surrounding visitors and ripping them off. Earlier this month, the city took down the signs that the yellow taxis used to mark their territory. Gastelum says visitors from San Diego should feel free to take any cab they want, including Ubers and non-yellow cabs. Either white and blue, blue and white, red and white, green and white, green, blue, black, gray, yellow, whatever. They can take any taxi they want. That's mobility. They can be assured that it's safe. Gastelum has tips for tourists who want to get a fair price for taxi rides through Tijuana. Ask them the price. If you don't like the, what they're charging you, take the other taxi cab. You can walk on the streets, feel comfortable, and spend a lot of money in Tijuana. Violence in Tijuana has reached record levels this year, with more than 700 homicides so far. 
But Castellum says tourists should feel safe. He says the crackdown on yellow taxis is part of an effort to make Americans feel good about visiting. If you go look, go ahead and looking for trouble, you'll find trouble. Yes, you will find it. And you won't take long. But if you go and look for doing things right, visit the right places, you don't have any problem. The yellow taxis took the city of Tijuana to court earlier this month. And a state administrative judge made a provisional ruling in favor of the cab drivers. But Gastelum says he's not worried about that. Oh, she's a corrupt judge. That's it. The judge did not respond to a request for comment. Gastelum says he doesn't plan to backtrack on his decision. Jean Guerrero, KPBS News. Developers hoping to transform the Qualcomm Stadium site into a soccer center development are asking a professional soccer league for patience. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson has the story. Soccer City supporters want Major League Soccer to give them more time. Project spokesman Nick Stone launched a campaign asking the soccer league to wait on its expansion plans. Two franchises will be awarded by the end of the year, but the league could hold off awarding the last two teams until after San Diegans vote on the Soccer City proposal. That'll happen in November 2018. Stone says the league would benefit from putting a team here. We have as many people watching Major League Soccer in the city of San Diego as watch it in the top five markets. And we don't have a team yet. This is going to be a great market for the city, for the Major League Soccer. And that's why we think there is a reason for them to wait for San Diego. Stone's development group promises to tear down Qualcomm Stadium and build 4,800 homes, commercial space, a river park, and hotels. The development would pay for a soccer stadium. Former Building Industry Association president Mick Pattinson says it's a win for soccer fans and the city. We've got a, a lazy asset there called the queue, which needs to be put into productive use for the benefit of San Diego. The jobs, the economic development is fantastic. And the fact that we're even hesitating is a stunning shock to me. It's unclear if the league will wait for San Diego voters to weigh in some 16 months from now. Meanwhile, Democrats on the city council are asking to have the Qualcomm Stadium site declared surplus property, clearing the way for the land to be sold. The council will consider that item on Tuesday. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. Oceanside remains in political limbo as its mayor, Jim Wood, continues to recover from a stroke he suffered in May. KPBS North County reporter Allison St. John says it's still unclear whether he'll be able to return to the dais next month when the city council resumes meeting after the summer recess. Mayor Wood's aide says his medical condition continues to improve and his goal is to return to lead the city council meeting on August 9th. Wood has suffered several strokes, one in 2011 while on a lobbying trip to Washington, D.C., another a year later, and a third incident in March of 2015. In those cases, he was back on the job within days or weeks. Recovery from the latest incident in May is taking longer. Under California law, a city council could declare a seat vacant if it's unoccupied without permission for more than 60 days. Oceanside Council has already granted Wood an extension. He won re-election for his fourth term as mayor of Oceanside last November, and his term runs through 2020. In the event of a vacancy in the office of mayor, the city attorney says the council would have 60 days to either appoint a council member to complete the term or call a special election. In the KPBS North County Bureau, Allison St. John, KPBS News. The California Department of Education recently published updated advanced placement test results for high schools across California. Megan Wood with our media partner, iNewsSource, crunched the numbers to see how schools in San Diego performed. More than 60,000 AP tests were taken by high school students in San Diego County last year. 63% of those earned a passing score of three or higher. That's about 7% higher than the statewide average. The school with the highest pass rate was Mueller Charter in Chula Vista, and the school with the lowest was San Diego High School of Business and Leadership. In the past, there was no easy way to compare high school AP test results over time, but now you can with a searchable database I knew source created. All you have to do is go to data.inewsource.org, then search by your district or school name to compare five years of AP test results. For example, let's search Eastlake High School in the Sweetwater Union High School District. You can see the school's pass rate dipped in 2015, but improved the next year. 
Now, let's see how high school, East Lake High School ranked in Sweetwater last year. First, we type in Sweetwater, sort by the percent passing, and then sort by year. You can see Eastlake is at the top in the district with a pass rate of more than 70%, followed by Olympian and San Isidro. At data.inewsource.org, you'll find the same databases for SAT and ACT scores. For KPBS, I'm Megan Wood with iNewsource, an independently funded nonprofit partner of KPBS. Attorneys for Los Angeles County are in court today, and they're hoping to block a restart of natural gas injections at the Aliso Canyon storage facility near Porter Ranch, in Porter Ranch, rather, and are challenging state regulators who say it's safe to resume limited operations there. A four-month leak in 2015 and 2016 since tons of methane into the air and force thousands of residents from their homes. Transportation officials are paving the way for self-driving cars in California. In preparation, California highway lane lines will become thicker, growing from four inches to six in order to make staying in the lanes easier for those self-driving cars. Not only are they going to be wider, they're going to be more retro reflective. In other words, they're going to be reflecting back the light that's shown on it. So they're going to be brighter lanes, uh, thicker striping. It's going to be easier to see where those lane lines are. More than 30 companies have secured permits to test autonomous vehicles on California roads. Caltrans says funding for the upgrades comes from the state's recently approved gas tax. Three years ago, San Diego bought dozens of specifically equipped cameras to count bicyclists at intersections around the city. The plan was to use their data to help city planners make smart decisions on where to build safer and more comfortable bike lanes. But KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen explains the cameras haven't been doing a great job. It's part of the base of bike lane. Okay. I'm at the intersection of Grape and Harbor on the corner of Waterfront Park. It's just past morning rush hour, but hundreds of cars are still passing by, heading to and from the airport. Every so often, a bicyclist rides by as well. The camera is pointing in the direction where the zone is needed. Brian Genovese is a traffic engineer working on the city's bike program. We're looking at a camera equipped with bike detection software mounted right next to a stoplight. Cameras that detect cars are nothing new. The city has many already. Here's what is new. Right now, it will discriminate between a bicyclist and a vehicle. Cars and trucks are the city's biggest contributors to climate change. And a huge part of the city's climate action plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions is to get people out of cars and onto bikes. So counting bicyclists is important for measuring progress. We need to monitor where we are in relationship to our goals. Are we achieving our goal? Do we need to do something different? Right now, our program is designing uh, improvements to bikeways, and we need to know if we're attracting an increased ridership based on those improvements. But there's a problem with the bike counting cameras. They haven't been working all that well. This is a promotional video from the camera's vendor demonstrating how the cameras are supposed to work. Genovese and other traffic engineers have been going through their footage, counting bikes, and cross-checking their numbers with the camera's automated bike counts. The numbers don't match up. The discrimination between modes, it's a an ev really evolving technology, and I think it's improving. Uh, are we there yet? We're still working with the vendor to get that accuracy better. Genevieve's declined to say exactly how bad the data from the cameras are. But he said sometimes the cameras count cars as bicyclists or vice versa. They might be focusing on the wrong areas or have dirt on their lenses. City engineers went out with the camera's manufacturer a few months ago to troubleshoot. But Genevieve's confirmed the data still isn't accurate enough. Counting bikes is important because it allows you to plan for the future. Samantha Ollinger is executive director of Bike SD, a nonprofit advocacy group. She says she's happy the city is investing in bike counting technology, but she says the city should have figured out by now how to get the cameras in working order. If the city had installed and calibrated the cameras when they were purchased three years ago, she says, we could have three years of good data and to not have good data or to have buggy data that they aren't able to make good decisions on. It just seems sort of a lost opportunity in a way. 
because I feel like a lot of other cities have solved the problem of how to count bike traffic. It's true, other cities are doing a lot more with counting bikes than San Diego. Cities including Portland and Long Beach have electronic signs next to a bike counter that show you the counts as they go up in real time. Ollinger says that kind of transparency is valuable and helps encourage people to bike. So what's taken the city so long? A spokesman said the cameras took more than a year to install because staff had a backlog of other work to do. And it took a bit longer to get a live video feed up and running so traffic engineers could check the camera's accuracy. Genevieve says the city bought the bike counting cameras as part of a pilot program. So given the problems with the data, will that program be expanded? Well, I think we would have to explore those opportunities as they come up. Where, as I mentioned before, we're exploring different technologies. So I, I can't answer it one way or the other right now. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. You can see a map of where the city's bike counting cameras are located at kpbs.org. And tune in tomorrow for a look at the problems facing the county's bike counting program. I'm Harry Srinivasan. On the next News Hour, where do Democrats go from here? We talk with Tom Perez, head of the DNC. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. A massive wildfire burning near Yosemite National Park is now 50% contained. Evacuations in Mariposa County have been lifted, but 63 homes and 68 structures have been destroyed. 1,500 others are still threatened. So far, the Detweiler fire has burned 120 square miles. And the Detweiler fire is a prime example of what we're in store for the rest of this year, as well as several years to come. Just because the fire is seeded into those grass fields and then is propagated and promoted up into the brush and up into the timber. Eleven significant fires are currently burning in the state. Lots of cloud cover in San Diego today, and in some areas, rain and thunderstorms. In Oceanside, they're getting ready for the annual Supergirl Pro Surf Contest this weekend. You can see that thick marine layer from this morning. Regina Miller has more in tonight's forecast. Well, we've had an increase in uh, moisture as we have the monsoonal flow starting to return, and that brought some showers and some thunderstorms around for the earlier part of the day. You can see they're moving across Mount Laguna up towards Ramona as we went through the early part of the day and then exiting off to the east. We do have flash flood warnings that are in effect here where you're seeing the blinking. That's where there were some heavier storms in parts of Arizona. And then across parts of southeastern California here, interior locations. Flash flood watches because any storms that do pop up because of the monsoonal moisture could have some heavier downpours and that could cause some problems with some flash flooding. So for tonight though, 70 degrees along the uh, metro areas turning cloudy overnight in San Diego County. We'll see some of those showers or thunderstorms could still be around Borrego Springs down to Mount Laguna and into Ramona as well. And as we head into your Tuesday afternoon, some thunderstorms popping up across parts of Arizona, southern Nevada, but can't rule out a little bit of uh, interior locations here of southeastern California getting into the act. In Ramona, 87 degrees for your high tomorrow. Borrego Springs tops out at 103. And in the coastal locations, partly sunny, humid. We've got that tropical air in place, 78 degrees. Clouds giving way to sunshine on Wednesday at 79, 80 degrees, and partly cloudy for your Thursday. Inland locations, 85 degrees degrees, partly sunny skies for your Tuesday, 87 and partly sunny on Wednesday, 89 on Thursday and Friday with some sunshine in the forecast. In the mountain locations, we have some sunshine mixing with clouds. We can't rule out the chance for uh, maybe a heavier thunderstorm around with some of that monsoonal moisture. So we'll have to watch if any storms do pop up the potential for some flash flooding in these mountain locations. Temperatures getting into the upper 70s on Wednesday and on Thursday, low 80s by Friday, and most of that monsoonal moisture uh, gives us a little bit of a break on Friday. In the desert locations, 103 for your Tuesday, Wednesdays at 105. I'm Regina Miller, KPBS News.
It's a wrap on Comic-Con 2017. The pop culture festival closed yesterday, but one part of it will have an impact on San Diego for weeks to come. More than 1,800 units of blood were collected at the convention's annual blood drive. That's the most ever in the drive's 41 years. The San Diego Blood Bank offered some incentives. People who donated got Guardians of the Galaxy merchandise and were entered for prize drawings. The blood bank says donations have dropped late so the drive is a big help. Remember the movie The Martians. The film was praised for its scientifically accurate portrayal of how someone stranded on Mars might survive. The author who wrote the book the movie was based on says he always strives to get the science right in his work. The Martian's author, Andy Weir, is speaking tonight at the Fleet Science Center about the importance of science in science fiction. Earlier today, he stopped by KPBS to talk with our science reporter, David Wagner. You studied computer science at uh, UC San Diego, and you used to work as a programmer. You never formally studied astronomy, but it's a huge part of your work. So what got you passionate about space travel? Uh, I don't know. I think it's just a, a lifelong hobby that I've had. Um, a large part of it is my dad was a dork, my, or is a dork. He's, he's fine. Um, and my mom is a, is a dork as well. And, um, and so I just kind of grew up in a science-loving family. Some of the writers that have influenced you, people like Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, they tend to explore you know, big ideas about what future societies might look like. Contrast that with your work, The Martian is really about the, the details about space travel. Why do you like to focus on these kind of smaller, more granular uh, things in your work? Hmm, I don't know. That's a good question. Uh, I think it's because I, I just, I really love problem solving and I like watching characters solve problems when I'm watching a, a show or reading a book. And so I kind of want to write stories like that. Um, I'm less interested in speculating about the future of humanity and more interested in like specific things. And you're really big on getting the science right in your work. Some people might say, you know, science fiction, it's fiction after all. Why is it important for you to get the science right in your work? Well, it's important to me because that's kind of the path I've chosen. I like hard science fiction. I like realistic science. Um, part of it is almost laziness in that if you don't ever break the rule, the laws of physics in your story, then you don't need to make up what happens when they break. And you don't need to answer uncomfortable questions like, why don't they just use a transporter to, you know, transport a bomb onto the enemy ship and, you know, stuff like that. Um, that's part of it. But also for me, just watching TV, I always like <clears throat> a little bit when there's uh, when there's this blatant violation of physics. But then I guess it's sort of an uncanny valley. I don't like it when there's like a little bit of breaking the laws of physics, but if you start really breaking them, then I'm happy again. So if you have a warp drive, fine, as long as you're internally consistent on how that works. Your novel, The Martian, though, is, is so accurate on, on certain things that it's actually being taught in high school classrooms now, right? And, and not in English lit classes, but in science classes. Um, how are teachers using this book to, to teach their students something about science? Well, I think the biggest uh, problem that uh, teachers have in high school, and it's also being used in junior high, is getting the kids engaged in the science, getting them to care about it, because there's a lot more interesting stuff going on. Um, and this, this gives them a story where they kind of like root for the protagonist, and then the teacher can stop and say like, okay, well, now Mark has this problem. Like, okay, and here's his problem, and they set up the math problem. Now, how many potatoes does Mark need to grow to survive for this long? And the kids end up doing creative problem solving with a, with a goal uh, instead of just being given numbers and formulas and told to solve it. It's less abstract in that way. Yeah, it's more tangible and it's um, hopefully for them more fun. So you have a new book coming out this fall called Artemis. Mm -hmm. um, it's been described as a heist thriller on the moon. Yeah. Um, we don't want to go into spoiler territory here, but talking about science, what sort of scientific topics might you be exploring in this new book? Well, for this one, uh, the story is more, I mean, it takes place in a city on the moon, and the main character is a woman who's a small-time criminal, and she gets in way over her head. So it's really much more uh, a crime-slash-heist, you know, caper kind of novel. So it's not so intensely focused on the science as The Martian was. 
but it's still completely scientifically accurate. So I designed a moon city from the ground up. I did, figured out how they do everything, like how to take local minerals on the moon and smelt them into aluminum and where they get their oxygen and how they deal with all the problems that you'd have. And uh, it's, all, it's all solid. That was the Martian author, Andy Weir, talking with KPBS science reporter David Wagner. Weir is speaking at the Fleet Science Center tonight at 7. Here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Morning Edition, a local nonprofit is helping people learn bankable skills by serving up a culinary education. And on Midday Edition, tackling the homeless crisis, the newly formed Select Committee on Homelessness hears proposals for getting people off the streets. That's tomorrow on KPBS Radio. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great evening.